All right, hi everybody. This is Ron McGovern. Welcome to Design Chat number 21. Uh, thank you all for coming. I know uh, the president's speaking tonight, so we might have some more people uh, uh, fly in afterwards. So uh, this is Design Chat. My name is Ryan McGovern on Twitter. I am at Hoopajub and at Design Chat. Every week we get together and we bring together the uh, design community. So, um, so this week we've got Mr. Carlos Segura from Chicago, Illinois. Hey, Carlos, you just flew in the screen. Yes, thank you. Hi. Sorry about that. That's okay. What's going on, man? Welcome to Design Chat. Oh, glad to be here. This is uh, awesome. Had a lot of uh, a lot of people. Uh, I hope will be a part of this. It's going to be a lot of fun. Very cool, man. Um, so, what the deal is? If anybody uh, hasn't been to a Design Chat before, we'll do about uh, thirty to forty-five minutes of discussion here, and uh, then we'll open it up to the audience. Uh, yes, Gary, you can applause if you want. I see you in the chat room. Um, we need that. We need audio just for applause. I need sound effects. Maybe I'll do that next time. Um, oh, there you go. That was I got a, I got a live studio audience. Uh, we're broadcasting from Samata Mason in West Dundee, Illinois. Uh, SamataMason.com. We got some links. Um, the, we've got an account sign in here, design chat links. So as we talk about things and reference things, um, those links will pop up, and if you're thinking about the chat later, look up Design Chat links on Twitter, and uh, and we'll have all of them sitting there uh, later on. So, um, all right, so let's get going here. Um, Carlos, uh, you know, any, anybody who's uh, gone through a design school or, you know, even looks up design in Chicago, they're, they're going to come across your name. You are a very busy person, and uh, you make it very easy to do research on you because you were spread all over the internet. Um, and uh, so first of all, congratulations just for all your success, especially with you know, Segura itself and then uh, car type and everything else that's taken off. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that, that is a lot of fun, that car type thing. I bet. And, and, and it's a little hard to see right now actually on the screen. I've got all the logos from uh, car type and uh, bike type and moto type and truck type. Uh, when did uh, bike type, moto type and truck type all take off? Actually, car type was born from our bio page. Uh, we have, as you pointed out, a lot of uh, magazines and sites and publications do a lot of stories on us. So we would always get questions on, you know, what what do I like with my favorite movies or cars or whatever. So I did a, a top ten list of everything, but the car list kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I at one point decided that uh, it would be a good idea to make that its own venture and, and kind of apply the, you know, the, the daily likes and dislikes that I come across and make it into a business, which is kind of like a little bit of what we talk about when we, when we go speak, is how to find a way to create a business out of the things that you like to do. So it was a combination of really typography and cars, and that led to car type, which led to motor type and bike type and mo and bus type and truck type, and we have boat type and train type, which haven't launched yet. But uh, that's basically how it started, and it was a it was a, just a grassroots thing, and it's gotten to be uh, just an insane uh, exercise. It's been a lot of fun. So when are those uh, other type? Uh, site's going to launch? Well, the, the we have four up so far. The primary one is bike type, which is, I'm, I'm sorry, car type, which is the most populated one. Um, bike type and moto type are second, and truck type is lagging way behind. It's just a, an issue of time. You know, I've, I've got uh, I've got all those things to deal with, as as well as running Segura Inc., and of course there's T26 and 5inch.com, and it's just a an issue of manpower, that's all. And I do it all by myself. So it's I was just going to ask that question, Who, who's behind all these? Are you the one actually uh, putting the content up on every single one of these sites? And taking the pictures. Do you sleep? With the exception. <laughs> with the ex as a matter of fact, I'm having eye surgery in, in October because uh, I, I guess looking at, at the screen is affecting my eyes so much. But no, it's, it's a, it's a full-time gig. It definitely is. Outside of the images that we get from all the media sites that we're members of, uh, I shoot every single picture on the site. We go oh, to car goodness. shows all the time. 
we just came back from uh, Germany. We went to the Porsche, uh, Mercedes, and BMW museums and did a couple of stories on them. So it's a lot of traveling as well. That is that is very impressive. It's it's a it's a. If anybody hasn't been through these sites, um, don't leave now. But after no, the chat, no, not now. Don't go now. <laughs> uh, spend you, you need to spend some time digging through these sites because they're deep, and especially if you're into automobiles at all, and even if you're just a fan of design in general, they're they're extremely entertaining, uh, you know, to, to dig through. Um, so uh, if anybody didn't see uh, through the announcements on Twitter, uh, at the end of the show, um, uh, Mr. Segura is going to give away a t-shirt for the best questions. So we're going to take some questions from the audience and the best one uh, wins a car type t-shirt. So uh, definitely stay tuned for that. Well, you also forgot to mention that they also get 20 uh, discs with matching cases from 5inch.com. Oh, I thought it was neither or. It's both. No, no, it's both, man. We go. Holy cow! We go big here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice. We go big. Even more incentive. Oh, sorry. I would, I would, I would have sent that message out earlier. Um. Okay. It's okay. <clears throat> so, uh, so moving right along. Uh, just in case there are any people here who, <clears throat> unfortunately, are not familiar with you, let's do a little bit of history. Let's do a little bit of where. Uh, Segura Inc. started in, uh, in your history from Spain to Chicago. Okay. Uh, well, I'm, I'm just going to start from Chicago. Well, uh, originally, I, let, let's go back to when I was in the I was originally in a band uh, in the disco days of the Miami, you know, this Miami Sound Machine and all those uh, uh, good old days of no DJs, no MP3s and all that kind of stuff. So, um, we got pretty big, and we had a number one hit in Spain, and uh, we did a bunch of uh, uh, nightclub uh, gigs. We were booked two years in advance. It came to a point where um, we were supposed to back up Cornelius Brothers and Sister Rose. N none of your viewers probably know who they are. But anyway, we were supposed to go to Europe. The, the offer they were giving us wasn't substantial enough in my view, so I quit the band. And at that time... Uh, I had done nothing but be in a band when I was uh, since I was 12 years old, and uh, I would just bitch and moan about my life every chance I got. Until one day, my godfather just said, "Why don't you just shut up and put all of those flyers that you used to do?" Because when I was in the band, I had three I had three jobs. I was the drummer, I was the truck driver, and I was the promoter. I I simply was just telling people where we were playing. I had yeah. no idea graphic design existed. Uh, I didn't know anything about advertising, and back then we did everything with press type. So I got pretty well known for the uh, the flyers that we were doing, what you would call rave uh, postcards today. And uh, word got out. I got a gig from a, a little design shop in in Miami. But my big break was when I answered an ad for an ad agency in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, because I used to live in New Orleans. So uh, when I was at this agency in uh, Baton Rouge called the Blackburn Company, uh, we, I, I was very, very fortunate to have worked for a guy who just simply just let me do whatever I wanted to do in the, in the largest sense of the, of the word. He uh, basically just gave me a job and disappeared, so I had no choice but to do that. But that first um, nine months that I was working for him, uh, we entered all the work that I did uh, with my copywriter, and we won so many awards that year in the Baton Rouge Art Directors Club that uh, it was kind of like a, a few people got upset because we, we won more awards than all the other agencies combined. There was a fuss made about it. Who is this guy, Carlos Segura? Advertising Age did an article about it. An agency in Chicago read it made me an offer and, and then I moved to Chicago in 1980 and became an art director for uh, Carol from Rosenberg. And since 1980 to 91, to do a very fast forward, I worked for, you know, BBDO and uh, Marsteller and uh, Young Rubicam and all the agencies. But the thing for me was that I just had this thing that was bothering me inside that I really couldn't place because I wasn't educated enough to know that there was a difference between advertising and design. So I um, 
I felt this level of discomfort while living in the ad agency business, which I don't regret because, I mean, you really do learn a lot. And you really do learn that making beautiful things isn't good enough. They have to also be smart. So uh, in 91, I quit and I started Segura Inc. Uh, there was a, four, a pretty big fork in the road for me at that time. We, I was supposed to move to Japan with my copywriter to go work for Dentsu, which, my, which was my lifelong dream. But uh, the art director quotas were reached, and that was the fork in the road that I talked about earlier. My, my partner, copywriter, left and went to work for Dentsu, and I stayed here in Chicago and started uh, Cigar Inc. Um, in 94, I started Thick Face Records, which was a private label uh, production company, if you will. We released about six different albums. Uh, 95... I'm sorry, that was in 92. In 94, we started uh, T26, which, I mean, this could be a whole discussion on T26 alone because it was a, I mean, if you go back in time, there was no internet. There was no no way for an independent type designer to publish their own work. It was a very difficult uh, landscape at the time. If you wanted something pretty funky, you'd either have to draw yourself or you'd have to, you know, do a lot of legwork. And we also started because we wanted to change a lot of industry things like increasing the licensing when you buy a font. And to this day, we're the only type foundry that offers 40% discounts to students because we understand, you know, being a student today is, is, is a pretty expensive and difficult thing. And a bunch of other stuff. And then uh, we started 5-inch uh, in 2001, I want to say, and then card type and all the other type sites a couple of years ago. So we had about 20 topics in there that I want to circle <laughs> back to. Sorry. Um, uh, but it sounded like a lot of this all began with that sort of moment with, I think it was your uncle that you said, he kind of told you, you know, stop your bitching. You know, yeah, stop, basically, stop complaining, get off up your butt and do something about it. And it sounds I really, like I really want to, yeah. That's a thought right. that you reflect in, in your discussions when you go and speak. I do, and I, um, it's something that I never forgot, because really, I think, I mean, if I can put it bluntly, we're a bunch of little babies today, you know? We, we just forget that it, this really is hard work, and you've got to invest your, your time and, and, and work really hard to, to become, uh, to, to rise above it all. So I, I've always approached the businesses that we have via the direction of doing something that you like, creating creating a path for your own life. <clears throat> you know, sometimes doing a, working for an ad agency is, is good for some people and it's not for others. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty heartbreaking. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I talk to that just complain up and down their life and they they just don't do anything about it. And really, there really is plenty you can do about it. Every business that I have was born out of a frustration. Being frustrated is good because it makes you want to change your life. 5inch.com was born out of us doing similar work for other clients that we would get commission for and it was simply a byproduct of, of what we were already doing. T26 was born out of the love of typography that is one of the disciplines that we use every single day in graphic design. Car type was born out of a combination of a personal love for vehicles and transportation and cars and typography. So, I mean, joining all these things and trying to make, make something out of a business that is viable is a good thing to do. And it's, it's not as, I mean, it's not easy, but it is doable. And so uh, it was very, very good advice that I got, in, which I never forgot. The design industry has... Uh sort of rolled over itself a number of times in the last 10 to 20 years. Um, so with all the new innovations, the new ways that we do our job, um, and now all the new ways that we can publish what, is, what it is that we design. Um, there's, there's a program at the School of Visual Arts called Design as Author for a master's degree in design. And it's, it's, it's something I've read about extensively. Um, you know, definitely something that I'm interested in um, as a designer who's been out there working for some amount of time. 
but the idea itself is what's important to me. You know that this sort of um, helping educate designers that um, all your work doesn't have to be for your clients. Your work can make you happy also because you're talking about things that you're interested in. And actually, Design Chat is um, you know was birthed because of that. Because you, right. you see this design community uh, spread all over the internet. Um, no one's really stuck on in, in one way of communicating, or or doesn't see, it, the groups seem sort of fickle, you know. So design chat is a way that um, design community can come together once a week, maybe meet somebody, talk about current topics, you know, and, and keep the communication going, you know. Right. And that that's my goal here, and and I, I understand where you're coming from because it it's born it was born out of out of a frustration. It's a perfect example of what we talk about. Um, it's it's you know sometimes there's there's also this this belief that uh, you know you always have to succeed and I, I don't actually think you always have to succeed I actually think that the fear of failing is what stops most people from doing anything and you just have to you, you can't be afraid to fail you have to be able to just try it I mean the worst that could happen especially in today's climate where you could li I mean look at the technology that we have in our fingertips you can just do something, and if it doesn't work, then you just do something else. It's just, it's not a big deal, you know? So uh, I, I really think that uh, just the possibilities are endless. It, agreed. It, it, agreed. It's, it's like, it's like uh, you know, what I was talking about, setting your own course for your own business. Uh, you know, sometimes I know that it's difficult to say, uh, you know, be selective about your work, do what makes you feel good, what makes you feel proud. Don't be afraid to say no to a client, but just be willing to accept the consequences of saying or acting as a leader. Because many times acting as a leader is what gets you fired. Most people say they want to hear what you have to say, but not a lot of them mean it. So you have to be prepared to be able to step up and say what you mean, but just know that it has consequences. What are the consequences? You may get fired, you know, or you may have less work, or you may not as be as busy. But then the other side of the coin is you might be happier, you might do better work, you might actually lead that behavior to not do client work and do your own stuff, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot of avenues that that gives birth to that I think uh, can be extremely positive for the, you know, the health of your life. What would you say today, and I know this changes all the time, are the biggest barriers to entry or challenges that a, a new designer is facing today? Well, first of all, I'm glad I'm not in that boat because it could not be harder. Some people say that this is the easiest time ever to become because you have all this technology in your fingertips, but in fact, that is exactly what makes it harder because now everybody wants to do it the climate today in, in the business world is one where people that have, that have been doing this for their entire life, that have careers doing this, are out of a job, much less people that are getting into it. It's very, very difficult to find, uh, to find work. But the, the reality is that because more people want to do it, there are more, the, you know, the, the cream of the crop is harder to find. I mean, there's just so, there are a lot of bad people out there that, you know, want to do this. Uh, there's plenty of good ones, but uh, it's just difficult to, to do it. My advice has always been technology or no technology is build a portfolio that speaks to what you want to make out of yourself. I think we Not, lost audio on you. Uh, no? No? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Everybody here testing. One, two, three. Uh, I think they can hear me. Okay, I'm going to keep talking. Let me know if you can hear me. Um, I forgot what the hell I was saying now. Can you hear me? Okay. Oh. Good? All right, yeah, good. Okay. So... Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, no problem. 
I often talk about, you know, we see countless portfolios here. Of course, more of them come in these days via PDFs and websites. But one of the things that has always bothered me is when I'm sitting in interviewing someone, either, you know, face-to-face -face or uh, via, or electronically. When someone apologizes for a piece of work in the portfolio, it is a complete turnoff for me. Because you shouldn't be showing anything that you need to apologize for. If you feel it's not good enough and it needs to be presented with an apology, then you need to take it out of your book. But the bigger thing is you need to show something that is going to represent what you want to be, not what you think the interviewer wants to see. Because they have no way of getting into inside your head. They have no way of understanding what you want to do. You are going to be doing for the rest of your life the kind of work that you show in your portfolio if you're not careful. So you really need to uh, craft that book to represent your future, not your present. And if you think that some of the pieces in there are a little bit far out, again, I go back to the statement earlier, is don't be afraid to fail or don't be afraid to have someone tell you they don't like it. You know, it's okay for someone not to like what you do. It's, that's why they make chocolate and vanilla. I mean, it's not a big deal. But you just have to be very, very, you have to baby your portfolio and make sure that you, um, you speak, you make a brand for yourself and, and treat yourself as, as a brand and be very careful how you put it out there. What do you think is more important, uh, school of life or school of design? Almost oh, definitely school of life. Absolutely. I mean, I, in thinking about your question, I don't think that I've ever hired a designer or art director to work for me that has been officially trained. Uh, I think they've been more grassroots and just organic. I think uh, curiosity is the most amazing thing. You know, I, I have a story to tell you. I, I should have sent you these visuals because this always comes up when I get interviewed. Mm -hmm. It was a thing that happened with a client uh, when I went to New York. Let me know if I'm going too long. But no, go ahead. We were, we were going to New York. We were having a meeting with Duran Duran uh, to design their comeback album. This was some years ago. And uh, we were, you know, I don't know if you've ever flown in New York in the winter, but it's just impossible. It's the plane's always late, it's bumpy as hell, it's like the weather sucks, you can't get a cab. So, of course, we were late for our meeting. But as we were rushing towards the meeting, uh, my client and I were crossing the street, hundreds of people waiting to cross. He's obviously in a rush, he's on the other side of the corner. By the time uh, I realized, I'm in, sitting in the middle of the street taking a picture of a manhole cover in the street. He And he... When I get to the other side, he goes, what the hell are you doing, man? We're late. And I said, well, didn't, didn't you see that? Well, see what? So I showed him a picture that I took that said it was a, the New York City uh, sewer manhole cover that said New York City sewer made in China. <laughs> and that just, I mean, this was 10 years ago. I know this commonplace now, but that just blew me away that, I mean, this just one example of, we spend our entire life walking by things that we don't even notice. And the funny thing is that a couple of years ago, I went to a meeting to have uh, the annual Corbis meeting with uh, Bill Gates, who's the owner of, of uh, Corbis. And right in front of the door of the building that we were meeting, it now says New York City sewers made in India. And it's like, it's just so fascinating. Last year I went to Las Vegas and, you know, manhole covers are made out of two pieces, the cover and the rim. The rim said made in Mexico and the cover said made in India. My point is that you just have to be more aware of your surroundings and regurgitate, if you will, that into your life experience, which if you're a designer of any quality, your life is your profession. You know, um, so I think that that's really the best teacher of all. Agreed, agreed.
Uh, when do you think we're going to see manholetype.com? <laughs> you know what, man? That is the most amazing thing uh, because I actually contemplated doing it, but it's just so overwhelming. There's m so much typography in, uh, in that that I, I actually gave up before I started because I knew it wasn't going to, was, it was being possible. Well, maybe that idea is more of a social thing, you know, where Possibly. you're not responsible for taking all the photos, but, you know, you, you put the message out there and it just yeah. populates itself. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen a couple of sites about manhole covers, and especially the ones in uh, India and uh, Asia and Japan. They're just so decorative. It's unbelievable. Um. So, you, I've seen I've seen some of your posts before on I think it was a Secura blog. One was the Chicago sidewalk problem. Oh my God! Um, so, you know there are a lot of things in your environment. I mean, you obviously spend a lot of time paying attention to your neighborhood, um, things around you, public spaces, um, and you seem to have a very acute realization of that. Is that something that's always been there, or did it develop once you started it to do design work? No, I actually, I, that was there way before design, before, I think that's part of my life as a human being. I, I think that I've always applied everything I see to everything I do. I mean, I did it when I was a drummer, I did it when I was a roadie, I did it when, you know, I mean, I, it, everything. I think that being aware isn't about being a designer, it's just being about being connected, you know. Uh, one of my other sites that I have is sadsite.com where I post these observations that uh, that I pick up on every once in a while. And uh, it, it's really just for fun, but sometimes I, I, uh, I post those things there as well. Um, I'm going to switch up the topic a little bit here. And because there's like 80 million things that we can go into. Um, font licensing. Uh, so as, as the music industry changes and you know they realize that everything is on the web and people are going to share songs and that sort of thing, we're seeing that same thing happen with type. Um, yeah. How do you feel about where all that's going and you know sharing sites and type, typography of course uh, specifically, uh, and what the future of that's going to be? Well, there isn't going to be much of a future if it continues. The truth of the matter is, I mean, going back to something that you said earlier about uh, e educating designers, but the public in general, I think that we're starting to grow up in this in a society that thinks that free is normal, and that uh, you can have something just because you can take it, not because you have purchased it or have earned it or have worked for it. And uh, there's just so many livelihoods that are affected by it. Obviously, the music industry has changed. It's funny, I just a couple of days ago heard a thing on NPR about it was uniquely funny to them that there was a celebration of Apple's, I think they were selling one billion songs or something like that. I may have the numbers wrong. But uh, when you go back just five years ago, they were selling, uh, I think it was 9 to 12 billion uh, albums, CDs per year. Uh, when you take someone's font, you affect the designer, you affect the company, you affect the livelihood. of. I mean, some of these projects take two, two three years to do. So... Unfortunately, it's affecting us and everyone else in the business, and it's also affecting the, the honest people that actually buy and support foundries like us because, you know, there was a time when, when T26 first started back in 94, one of our claims to fame were our, our font kits. It was literally, our font kits were, were based around the Fluxus movement of the 50s where basically they were, they were little collections of artistically produced uh, limited edition pieces, uh, letterpress, linoleum cuts, uh, offset, uh, you know, die cuts, all kinds of stuff. 
And we would produce about uh, five to 8,000 of each. And once they ran out, they ran out forever, and we never did them again. I mean, those days are gone, and we can't afford to do that anymore because the income just isn't there to support it. And so eventually, everything trickles down to less and less and less, including the very product that we're talking about, which is typography development. We, sometimes we spend more time per day chasing down these torrent sites that take our fonts and just, you know, post them up to be had by anybody who wants them than actually creating for the public that wants it. So it, it's, it's definitely a problem. Um, I think it needs to be tackled by just simply educating, and I don't mean just designers, I mean like from the beginning, like kids in first grade, like there needs to be a new form for the the world of technology and how we treat uh, digital data and understand that digital doesn't mean free and digital doesn't mean that someone didn't make it. You know, it's, it's a very tough issue. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. The um, photo houses have done something interesting in the last couple years where um, it started off when uh, when you're looking for a photo uh, you're trying to pick something out. Uh, they used to give you a, a, a downloadable comp, and that was yeah. always a low res, watermarked, uh, yeah. very poor quality image, which made it which made it almost impossible for you to design something with, um, and then show it to a client and have them be impressed because, you know, it's just a, frankly a low quality piece of junk. You'll never be able to do anything. And now, right. if you're you know sort of registered with them as a professional designer, um, and you have communication with them. The, they will comp you the highest res image that you want. Now it's not right. something that's open to the public, um, but what it does is it encourages uh, professional designers to get those images in front of clients, clients who will then purchase them. Do you see, could it be that type could also move in this direction where uh, the lines of communications between uh, the designers, the clients, and the type foundries sort of open up where you get, you know, it turns in, what I find with the images, it sort of turns into a playground where you realize, wow, I can get my hands on all this stuff now and create these beautiful things, whereas it, those licenses, paying for those fees, never would have happened before until they started opening up those lines. Do you think that's a, at all possible with the uh, typography design? Yeah, I mean, we, we've, we're part of a consor consortium of, of foundries that are trying to find a way to uh, protect our product as well as be as giving to the industry as we can. I mean, I, I feel T26 has tried to do that from the very beginning. Uh, the technology for typography is, is a little bit, it's not like we can do like software where it can be, you know, licensed and, and tracked by, uh, uh, you know, numbers and uh, software numbers and, and registration numbers. I mean, I wish there was. I, I, I would love it. I would love typography to, to turn into a uh, almost like a rental usage type thing where you don't actually buy the font. You can, you can just use it for a certain period of time. Say you subscribe to a foundry. Uh, you use it for a period of six months. Your usage permissions expire, if you will. You don't even install it into your computer. I mean, I, that technology is just simply not around yet. Um, but I think some... I think we uh, might have lost the feed here with uh, Segura, so I'll fill in. Uh, Carlos froze. So, Carlos, if you're listening, refresh your screen and uh, sign in again, and, uh, and we'll keep on going. Um, for anybody who just came in here, um, we're going to do a giveaway. Carlos is going to give away a, a car type t-shirt and um, a case of five inch uh, discs um, to the person with the best questions. So at the end of the conversation, we're going to do a, uh, a Q&A. So we'll take questions from the audience. And, um, and also, uh, at the end, you can throw out your, uh, your Twitter address and, and uh, we'll, we'll, you know, so everybody can see. Um, so we'll just wait a couple seconds and see if he, uh, see if he comes in. Has anybody seen anything? It's hard. Sometimes it's hard for me to tell uh, from my feed if what you guys are seeing because I don't see the same thing. Still frozen. Still frozen. 
Carlos is frozen. That was dumb, sorry. Uh, so go ahead and uh, while we, uh, we got a captive audience here, um, maybe uh, start throwing some questions out now and uh, I'll do some uh, copy and pastes and uh, start throwing those at him as soon as he comes back. Now, what subjects do we want to talk about? There's some, uh, some current news. Um, if anybody's heard about the, uh, like the IKEA catalog has just changed their font. It's very sad. From, uh, I believe, Futura to Verdana. And at least on Twitter uh, and a few blogs, I've seen, um, you know, a lot of professional designers are upset about this, you know, because of the, um, yeah, yeah, it, it happened. Uh, because of the history of Verdana, um, and you know, and and the design integrity itself of the brand of IKEA kind of goes against, you know, their brand identity, and it's you know it's kind of a shame. Um, and from what we've heard, it, IKEA has no intention of changing uh, the font back or addressing it because the general public is not aware of the history of Verdana, and uh, most for the most part aren't offended by uh, by this change. So what do you guys think in the room? What do you guys think about Futura? If they did have to change to another font, what would it be? What would you guys recommend uh, if it wasn't Futura? And why? Comic Sans, yeah, funny. <laughs> oh, crowd, guys. Seriously, pick it up. Euro style? Goth style? Does anybody know if they changed it on their site too? Oh, here we go. Hey, Carlos. Hey. Welcome back. I don't know what happened. I've been here all along. Frozen time. How long were you talking before you knew you were frozen? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we just changed the subject on you. We're talking in the uh, chat room about uh, IKEA's recent change from Futura to uh, Verdana. Have you listened? Have you seen any of the outrage? Yeah, I, I did a. I did a. Yeah, I did a post on that, uh, I think, when it happened, but I'm actually surprised what a big deal this has turned out to be, to be honest with you. Uh, do, you do you think it's something that's just going to live on in the design community as discussion and outrage and never venture out further than that? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that anybody before this ever thought that the IKEA logo was something that needed to be saved. Did they actually change the logo, or was it just the type on their font? Uh, well, the, lo on their the logo, the logo, it's the logo type. Yeah, they changed the logo type. I guess I missed that part of it. Yeah, I have it on the Segura homepage. I think it's still there. Yeah, it is. And um, there's a link to it too. Yeah. Somebody... You're still there, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's on there. But yeah, I don't know. I, what are your personal feelings on it? I mean, you know, it really doesn't make any difference. The change, it just, the, the, the other one was fine, the new one's fine. So what in design right now excites you? Uh, people, um, ventures, um, anything that's happening in the design world right now, what's getting your attention? Well, I mean, I have to honestly say that I'm just so into the car thing right now that I'm completely uh, amazed and have always been amazed by the industry as a whole. Um, I mean, there's sometimes hundreds of thousands of parts in a one vehicle that is each designed by human beings. And they all fit together, and they all work, and they all last for an incredible amount of time. And it's just astonishing to me uh, how they can even sell cars for what they sell them for. Because I, I don't know how they can afford to do it. It's just incredible that so much design goes into a project. Uh, things that we as users never even see. I mean, can you imagine the amount of pieces inside of an engine? or the little washers behind the door, or just all kinds of stuff that that behave more than the obvious, like a washer. It's more than just putting a space between a nut and a plastic. It's there so it doesn't squeak, it doesn't fall, it doesn't break, it doesn't, you know, it, it withstands an accident. I mean, 
I guess car design for me is just an amazing. I would have loved to uh, to be in that in that arena. I don't know that I'm capable or talented enough to do so, but I would still love to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd love to see a uh, Segura original vehicle. You know, uh, I got a, a um, car first. Yeah, I got. I was actually talking to a company in Phoenix about that. It's kind of like uh, doing what Chip Foos does, but uh, they went out of business before the before the thing got uh, organized, so that didn't work out at all. Would it be an electric vehicle or would it be a loud gas guzzling monster? The two, the second. <laughs> sort of be a throwback '70s kind of thing. I don't know if it'd be a 70s thing. I actually think that's what's wrong with Detroit is they're too stuck on the past. I mean, not now. I think Detroit's doing some great stuff right now. But this retro thing is just overdone to death. How about motorcycles? Um, there's Actually, there's a design thing we can talk about here. There's a, uh, an electric motorcycle uh, called the Inertia. Yeah, right I have now. it on bike type. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, there was... I don't know about outrage, but a story broke um, that uh, Crispin Porter and Bogusky had put out a message on one of the uh, spec design sites asking people to design a logo for the inertia. Once that got out that it came from Crispin Porter and Bogusky, um, there, there were some people that are upset that they're participating in spec work. Have you had have you crossed paths with spec work at all, and what are your thoughts on that practice? I absolutely hate spec work. I, I don't even understand it. I, I've always, one of the things that used to drive me crazy when I lived in the uh, ad agency business world is how agencies treat their, their uh, employees when it, becomes, when it comes to new business pitches. I mean, I actually quit my last agency, and... It is the very thing that made me start my firm over this very issue. Uh, I, I just think it devalues the very craft that we're trying to promote as intelligent and thoughtful and important. When you give something for free, it's hard to then ask money for it. it you, you devalue the importance of it. And I just don't see a place for it. I don't like the be the activities that a new business pitch goes through and requires to try and get new business i if if i'm a if i'm a client and i go to leo burnett for example and if if i can't tell that they do good work then i'm an idiot i mean it's just that simple you know so i don't i don't like doing stuff for free i i don't I don't think it's a good practice. I don't think spec work is good. I know that there, uh, there are other sides of the coin, which some would argue are, well, you know, that's all good and well for Carlos Segura to say that because he's all set up and ready to go. But, uh, you know, what about the guy who's starting out that doesn't stand a chance? You know, I, I started out too, and I never did spec work. And uh, I just think that, setting a value for yourself is important as a person. Um, when you're dealing with your client and starting that new relationship, how does that story usually go? I would imagine that you get quite a few calls, get quite a few inquiries uh, for house to do the work. Um, do, do you go after new business? Does Sergio do that? No, we don't. And we also don't do estimates. Um, we don't, because nobody knows what you have in your pocket except you. So if you need a logo to identify a project, it doesn't really matter what logos cost in the industry, because that's not going to change the amount of money that's in your pocket. But it does matter how much money you have in your pocket. So, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, which is what changed my, uh, my view on this, how many times we were asked to respond to an RFP and go back and forth with the estimating process and this and that only to be told, oh, but we only have $5,000 or, you know, I mean, my God, you know, uh, we don't, we, we don't, uh, we don't go after work 
we've been lucky enough to not have to do that. But I think that's all really like superficial stuff. I think the most important thing on how to handle a client and who you choose to work for is it's kind of like going out on a date. You know, you know, you know for the in the first five to ten seconds whether it's going to work out or not. You just know it. I mean, human beings have that built in. It's no different with a client. And so, if a client talks down to you or doesn't feel like they're going to be cooperative or you can sense that maybe you're not on the same page, you know, that's pretty easy to tell at the very beginning. And um, that's really what sets the tone for moving forward. And I think it's easier said, it's easier done, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard to, to pick out. Um, but I think that the other important aspect of it is just to be simply just honest just be s straightforward and honest with the client you know they're really putting a lot of trust in you I mean they really do depend while I, I I talk about you know not doing spec work I also talk about acting responsibly and doing the right thing for your client and guiding them and and trying to help them do the right thing even if it isn't what they've asked for Many times clients don't ask for what they need, they ask for what they want or what their competition is doing or what someone else told them they should do. They don't really know what they want. And so it's your job not only to do creative, but to guide them and to help them understand what kind of creative they need to have. And, uh, you know, we, we, we also talk about uh, respecting the target audience. We often talk to our clients and we tell them that, you know, and, this, and by the way, you you need to have this discussion with your client at the beginning when you're friends because doing it later isn't going to work because usually later you're enemies and so what we tell them is you're the client we know you're paying for this but you're completely irrelevant to this picture we're not doing work for you we're doing work for your target audience we're being responsible and and we need to be strategically aligned with the needs of the target we need to understand what it is that your audience needs. We're not going to do something in yellow because it's your wife's favorite color or because someone told you that that's the cool color or, you know, as an example. And again, that goes back to the, the issue of being upfront and, and trying to uh, accept the consequences of being brutally honest and, and acting in a helpful but, but in a leadership type of way. You know, sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But I think in the long run, I mean, we've been very fortunate that, that it's worked out because I think people really do like honesty and they like to feel like you're on the same page and you're trying to help them instead of just, you know, doing a project so you can build them as much as you can, which is unfortunately what most ad agencies do. Creative briefs. Mm -hmm. Is that something you make use of and um, sort of rely upon at the beginning and middle and end of a project? What was the first word you said? I didn't hear you. Creative briefs. Creative briefs, yes. Creative briefs, uh, We, you know, I have mixed feelings about creative briefs. Again, uh, we often get one-inch creative briefs that you could simply change the logo and it would mean the same thing to any company. We want to be, you know, we're reliable, we're this, we're that and the other. Everybody wants to say the same thing. I think that the, the task of somebody who really wants to be committed to do something completely different is to read between the lines of a creative brief. Try to really understand what it is that makes something special. Uh, not only as the final product of, your, of what you create, but uh, something special to the, to the end user. So I don't know. I think creative briefs perhaps might be a good starting place. I, I, don't, I, I think that I'm just more gut-oriented. You know, I, I just feel, I, I can just feel what needs to be done in a more natural, unprepared, unstructured type of type of way, it's you know, 
it's funny how I, I've always been intrigued by how human beings change when they are a regular person and when they are a client. They just don't behave the same way. And I've always, I thought that I would have figured this out by now, I, but I just haven't been able to figure it out. I, I don't understand why the behavior is so completely different when someone becomes a client. And often, almost everyone in the room can see the obvious way to, or the obvious right thing to do except the client. And I don't understand that. We could probably do another two hours on struggles of uh, client relations. Um, and well, actually, I which think leads me to invite you back uh, for another session sometime because we're almost at the end of our time for right now. We got to okay. close up just after nine o'clock. We've got about six, ten, fifteen minutes. We can... um, so let's uh, change up a little bit. Open up the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I'll do my best to capture a couple. And it, Carlos, if you see something you want to address, go ahead and uh, attack it. Okay, yeah, this thing's moving so fast and it's pretty small. I can't really see it that well from here. But uh, my question, Carlos, is. What's on your shirt? Okay, this is a uh, Armani shirt. It's a bunch of uh, logos and cars and just that's what it is. What How color? should uh, graduating students brand themselves to find a career in the ad agency or design agency? Well, I think first you got to decide decide what you want to do. And art? Do you want to be an art director or do you want to be a designer? It's completely different. Uh, and even within that discipline, do you want to be a broadcast art director? Do you want to be a web uh, developer? Do you want to be a print art director? I personally uh, went down the print. Uh, I just love print. I love the tactile nature. I love how paper smells, how ink uh, feels, uh, all those things. So my choice was to be with print. So I think that's the, a really important thing. Um, do I think print is dead or dying? I don't think print will ever die as long as human beings are walking this earth. They uh, will. They can't. Uh... Also well, okay. This question: what, Why do you have to choose what you want to be? Isn't that narrowing you down? I don't think it's actually narrowing you down. I think um, it's just a, it's a, it's just the, the differences in the disciplines. It's you can't be good at everything. You might be good at a few things, and you might do a little bit of everything just okay. But if you focus on one thing, then you're going to be a great uh, a great you know film director. You know, Francis Ford Coppola doesn't do websites. He does movies. Are you catching some of these? Can you throw Damn. some of these at me? I've got uh, a star squared. What do you look for when reviewing a designer's portfolio during an interview? Okay, well, we touched on that one already. Uh, do you want me to answer that one? or? got another one here. Um, had the power from this is from Ron Bandish. If you had the power to eliminate one font and make one font more well known, what would it be? I'll tell you why I can't answer that question. Because I don't actually subscribe to the favorite font philosophy. I uh, think I think that if you have a favorite font, then you haven't looked enough. And let me tell you this very quick story. One of the things that I often do is I get asked to go to ad agencies to help co-type direct print campaigns. And one time I, I was at this agency. I, w I won't name any names just to be nice. And uh, I was called in. I immediately saw the the executions that were on the table and just immediately and instantly had a level of discomfort that 
that I knew what it was, which, by the way, I don't think most people feel, I think most people feel the discomfort but can't identify the typography as the cause of it. So anyway, I thought they had simply used the wrong font for this campaign. So I asked the art director, do you think you picked the best font for this ad campaign? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah I think I did. And then I said, do you think you picked the best font that was installed in your computer, or did you pick the best font for the campaign? And of course, he said, the best font that was installed in my computer. I mean, I swear to God, that is just unacceptable. Unacceptable. So, I mean, in today's world where you can go online and search for whatever you want, uh, for him to cop out like that was just not the thing. So back to my favorite font. The reason I don't have a favorite font is because I think that typography often paints the page with more than just the words that they carry. It, it creates a personality and it's possibly the most important thing you could do for a, a piece of work is to spend time type directing. And I don't mean just picking the font. I mean kerning and letting and adjusting and tweaking and just spend time with the typography. It's the best thing that you can do to further your career as a designer or art director. This one's from my sister Fred. Do you think it's realistic for agencies to want designers to know things like HTML and other technical things? No, I don't think it's realistic and this goes back to my earlier point that I think you need to select what you want to be. You can't, you just can't be everything. You know, when I was an art director that was my task, being an art director. I wasn't a, uh, a photo retoucher. I wasn't a typesetter. I wasn't a, a, a web builder. I wasn't a back-end engineering guy. I wasn't uh, a film producer. I mean, I had a task to do, and I did it good because that's all I had to do. But now I think art directors and designers are expected to know everything, and I, I just don't think it's, it's possible or, or right, to be honest with you. I think you need to be selective about what you do. You know, I'll give you an example. Um, my friends at, at 37 Signals, Jason, that guy's a genius. And he's a genius because he knows he's, he's good at one thing. I mean, he's good at a lot of things, but he focuses on one thing. And that's why they're as successful as they are, because that's what they do. And that's it. That's all they do. Um, I was looking into uh, Seed Conference, which is a conference that you spoke at, uh, I think, in April. Well, we don't. I was digging in. That that definitely speak the website. If uh, I think it's seedconference.com, I could be wrong. Seed conference. Seed conference. Yeah. That website definitely speaks to what you were talking about about spending time with the typography. Absolutely. Because it is typography. There's no right. Images. Well, the seed conference conference was uh, born out of uh, it's a self-produced venture between me, Jim Kudall, and Jason Freed. Uh, we've done, I think, four so far. We're planning another tour uh, soon. Uh, and it, it, it is just a, a, a wonderful one-day event. Sometimes we do two days. And we just basically get together and exchange ideas and, and uh, talk about, you know, opinions. And, and we share our experiences and uh, it's, it's just an incredible uh, thing, which, by the way, it's one thing that, as I mentioned earlier, and Jason and Jim often talk about, and that is to make a business out of your strengths. That, that's yet another side business that we have that was born out of something that we like to do and some, something that we enjoy. So, you know. Um, I think we're at the point where we need to start rounding up here. I'm going to review the... Do you, do you want to pick the best question? Do you have one in your mind? I haven't been looking at them, but I, do I have to pick now or can we review them later? Do these questions go later. away? Okay. Uh, yeah, the text goes away. Okay. But I've copied, I've copied a lot of them. Um, okay. So I can send those to you and, and then we can um, uh, try to contact that person. Okay. Okay, um, so I'm going to start wrapping up here. Um, everybody, uh, if you want to throw up your Twitter handles on there so everybody can follow everybody. 
and watch him fly in. This is always fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'll start doing my thank yous. Um, thank you to uh, Samana Mason for letting us uh, broadcast from here uh, on the con uh, subject of conferences. Uh, next week is the CUSP conference, cuspconference.com. And that's about the design of everything. And uh, it's going to be really exciting because, you know, it's a, it's a conference for designers, but it's, it touches on a lot of other topics. And exciting news for me and Design Chat because we are going to be broadcasting live next week, uh, Wednesday night, maybe Thursday night. We're still working out some details. Uh, so go to cusconference.com, uh, register, uh, look at the people who are coming to talk because that's who you're going to see on Design Chat. Um, thank you to Mashable for letting us broadcast from Mashable Chat Lounge and tweeting it out. Um, that's been a very cool relationship. Uh, and of course, thank you to Carlos Segura for coming on. You know, there are a lot of tough topics that uh, I wanted to get into a little bit more and we need some more hours. So I'd, at this point, I'd like to invite you back for another session sometime. Be glad to do it. That'd be awesome. Uh, this this is a lot of the fun. stuff you do for the design community is awesome. You're definitely active and out there and talking to everybody, um, and people like to hear from you. So that's really well, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, be sure and give my best to Greg as well. Will do. Will do, definitely. He's not here tonight, but uh, we'll see him next week for sure. Um, okay. So uh, that's it. That's it for Design Chat number 21. Uh, pay attention to Twitter. I'm at Hoopajoob and at Design Chat. Uh, Carlos is at Segura Inc. Definitely uh, hit him up on Twitter. Uh, definitely good stuff coming from there. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Hey, thanks for everyone to join that joined us. Uh, it means a lot, and uh, I hope you got something out of this. Thank you, Carlos. All right. Good Talk night. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.